Conform to His Image by Elizabeth V. Baker originally published in the January to February 1932 issue of Trust Magazine Romans 829, For whom he did foreknow, he also did, predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God made man in the beginning in the image of God, and Jesus Christ was also made in the image of God, he was the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person. The first Adam was made in the image of God, and the second Adam was made in the image of God, the first man turned away and lost the image of God, and what God is after is to recreate the race and get it back into the likeness of God. I believe the new man is created in righteousness and true holiness, and I feel among other things that Christ came for, one was that we might see what the image of God was. In the Old Testament we find something of the character of God in the law and in the sacrifices. The whole Old Testament is full of representations of the holiness and character of God, but even then men did not seem to grasp it, and now God condescended to give us a walking image of Himself, as if He did not come down any longer on the printed page like a photograph, but the real person of God walking among men, my son, and now He says, There is your pattern, and there is the image I want you to bear. It was God revealing how divinity could walk in humanity, Jesus Christ did that. You are not to speak your own words, Jesus did not. You are not to do your own works, Jesus never did his works, the Father that dwelleth in me he doeth the works. Then the hot indignation of God could not tolerate a mere sanctimoniousness without anything behind it, this is your pattern, the loving of righteousness, and the hating of iniquity. God says we are predestinated to be like him, and now he has given us a walking sample, not only for us to look at, but that we may go into the hands of Christ, and be made like him. In the Gospel of Matthew you find a kingly picture. Read it and see the standard of righteousness given in the wonderful Sermon on the Mount. He says, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Take the book of Mark and read it through and see what the writer has to say about Christ. Read and see what Jesus did under given circumstances, what he did under this and that pressure, and you will get before you what Christ is like. In Mark you get the activity of Christ, In Luke we see the tender human heart of Jesus bearing with the sinful, you get the picture of the sinful woman, and the good Samaritan, then you get the prodigal son, the lost sheep, and all those wonderful pictures. Why, that is Jesus. It would do you worlds of good to read the Bible like that. Then turn to the Spirit and tell Him, Oh, I am not the least bit like that, you will have to make me over, and you will begin then to see how absolutely necessary the new creation is. You would go into His hands, and you would say, Lord, I cannot reproduce that image, but you must work in me. Images are produced in a number of ways, by molding in clay, then there is sealing wax or clay like when a stamp is put down in melted wax. If you see a reflection in a mirror of an image you get a perfect image if the mirror is perfect. You see engraving in precious stones, like in cameos, a whole figure is cut out in a cameo. Then there is writing in tables, the casting of metals, and there is carving in wood. All these are ways of producing an image. In the first place there must be preparation. Take that matter of the clay. In the 51st of Isaiah the Spirit says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. We all have to be dug up first, and we all have to come out of the same hole that the psalmist spoke of in the 40th Psalm, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. We all have to come out of that pit, we are all of the same kind of clay. God says, look at the pit from whence you were digged. He does not want us to forget how far from God we were. We were all the same, and while one may be more developed in sin on some lines than another, yet the same human heart was in us that would have produced the same sin if we had been in the same circumstances, and it is the grace of God that has placed us in more favorable circumstances. Over in Jeremiah God himself takes up that figure and speaks about the clay in the hands of the potter or eyes and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and, behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. The clay is full of grit and little pieces of rock that are foreign to the clay itself, and they have to mold it until all the resistance in the clay is taken out, and that is quite a process. Water has to be put into it and it has to be molded and kneaded, and then it is put away in the dark. After a time it is taken out and the same process gone through again. And the Lord said to the prophet, That is the way I have to do with my people. 
When the clay is put away in the dark it would seem as if it were forgotten, but then it is brought out and put through a more severe process than before, and all that before it can be put on the wheel and shaped, and then sometimes when put on the wheel it comes up against something hard and will all break, and you would think that was the last of it, but it says, he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Oh, he can reshape us, I think we all spoil the first vessel, and he has to remake us. We waste the most precious thing God has given us, and that is time, and we resist for years often, until God says, I cannot do without one what I would have liked, and he has to reshape him into something else. If we only knew how to go to pieces in the first place and be pliable, God could have his way right along from the beginning, and he would make something so beautiful for his glory. How we need to be reshaped until the hardness of our nature melts away. I have a feeling that we have spoiled such a lot of things, just beautiful things, God wanted to do, and he cannot do them because the time is past and he has to make another vessel. Let us ask God to take the unconscious resistance out, resistance resulting from our education, our mental makeup, the resistance of our nature in its cast, in its peculiar mold. All these things go to hinder God, and that is why Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind, the good and the bad alike. Pentecost lay behind when he said that. He had had marvelous blessing and it was all behind, and he pressed forward that he might be in the hands of God, to be molded into his likeness. Then, there is the wax. Wax, in order to have any impression, must be heated and melted and softened. Paul says, Ye are our epistles written not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Do you know, friends, we are all too hard. We are ashamed to cry in a meeting, we are as hard as flint, we will sit under the truth and be untouched by it, and God needs to melt us down and get some softness in our natures and in our hearts. Oh, don't let yourself be hardened and crushed over. When we were children we cried when a bird died. I declare we have lost our hearts of tenderness, and our friends may die and we be almost unmoved. There has come to be that kind of crystallizing into form that will not let our hearts be touched at the truth of God, and I believe God wants our hearts softened that he may lay over upon them the image of Jesus and make us like him. Don't you know we hate to show any feeling in public? Oh, Jesus wept. Standing before the most stupendous miracle he ever did, and yet because of his sympathy with those sisters he could weep tears. We need the tenderness of Jesus, we need the gentleness of Jesus, we need to be touched with the feeling of other people's infirmities, we need to have a sympathy and a mercy for the unrighteousness of other people, we need to get the soft and tender and sympathetic touch of Jesus upon our feelings, it says he was touched by the feeling of our infirmities, and if infirmities can touch a sympathetic chord in the heart of Jesus then other people's infirmities must touch a sympathetic chord in me if I am going to be like him. Don't you see it once we are not like that naturally? People that are not going right, we get tired with them, and say, well, go on that way if you want to, I have a feeling the Lord never said that. We need to have our hearts like wax that the Spirit may make an impression upon us. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You cannot afford to have today pass and you fail, then tomorrow you will fail, and all the days you will fail, and you will come up at last not having overcome. Why can't you overcome today everything that arises in your path, you cannot afford to let it go until tomorrow. I have such a sense that the time is passing, and the Lord will be here, and presently those that are ready will be caught away, and it is no injustice to us if we are not ready and left behind, because has the Spirit not been repeating again and again, Jesus is coming, get ready. It has come from the lips of little children, Jesus is coming, the Lord is sending the cry out into the earth to waken his church, Jesus is coming soon, get ready, it is the midnight cry that ought to arouse every sleeping soul. Do you know we are always going to conquer tomorrow, and tomorrow becomes today, and tomorrow never comes. Oh, it is so important, may the Lord speak it into our hearts and arouse us lest it cost us dear and we fail. Then there is a mirror. A mirror if polished to a degree of perfection you never see the glass at all, you look into it and you always see the perfect image of yourself, but you do not see the glass, it just passes right beyond your vision. That is what the Lord is after, the glass is invisible, and the image is visible. I believe that is the meaning of 2 Corinthians 3:18. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. As I have been telling you, look into those glasses of the gospel and see Jesus, and as you let your heart be melted and moved by his marvelous life and character you are being changed. You do not know it, but unconsciously to yourself you are being changed into his image from glory to glory by the Lord, the Spirit. 
In the revised version it says we are reflecting in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That means that you have looked until somehow you have become the mirror, and you are invisible, and people see in you the glory of the Lord, as you look in the mirror and see your own image, so people look at you and see the Lord. Think of it. Reflecting the image of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? But after all, I like the old rendering because that is what you have to do first. We all behold Jesus through the Gospels and through the Word by the Holy Spirit, until our hearts are touched by it, and our sympathies are moved, and our whole being is moved by the character of Jesus, until somehow the image is being formed in us and we are reflecting it, and then before we know it people will really begin to see Jesus and they will forget us and we will not make the impression of ourselves upon people but the impression of our Lord. Then there are hewn stones, buildings are built of stones. We have a beautiful picture in the temple, the stones were first dug up and then cut and fitted to one another, and they were all hewn out in the quarry. In putting up a stone building the architect has to know all about every stone, then the dimensions go into the hands of the mason, and every stone has to be calculated on paper before it is ever cut, and those papers go into the hands of the quarryman, and he has to make stones of all those sizes, and all this is done in the yard of the mason. Now we are in the quarry, and the Holy Spirit is getting us ready for that marvelous temple God is building, a spiritual temple where He is to dwell, and we are not all going to be the same shape and size, but if we will just stay in His hands and let Him chisel away, God will make something that He will be glad to see some day, and that will rejoice even the angels. It seems very wonderful but it is true. It speaks about our daughters being cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. God is making the grandest building that ever was conceived of, and never conceived by man, and that is the invisible temple into which the Holy Ghost will come and reign eternally, and here and now the Lord is at work upon every one of us. That will help to explain the blows which the Spirit gives. When the sculptor first takes the block of marble he sees all the time what he is going to make, but the first blow you would think he would break the thing to pieces, but he soon knocks off that rough part, then he begins to bring out the form and the work is done more slowly and carefully and as he nears the end there has to be little touches here and there to bring out the expression and the form. Sometimes the Lord gives us a huge blow, it would seem as if we were killed, but no, he is only hewing off a corner, but as you come on he will deal with you about little things, which are lawful perhaps, but he says, here is this deeper inner thing, he reproves you for a cross look, when before he would not if you had a fit of anger. He is going down into the very depths of our being, hold still in his hands. Then there are precious stones, these must be cut. After the diamond is taken from the mine sometimes it is cut down to half its size, to get the perfect cutting and the perfect light upon it. It comes out in the rough, and it looks as if you were throwing away something valuable, but it is cut and cut until at last you get something that will reflect the glorious light perfectly. It is small, but there is more value in a small diamond than in tons of stone. God is going to have jewels. Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. We get in Ephesians 1 23 the thought of the body of Christ being his fullness. The perfection of Jesus is his people, and the crown of glory on the brow of Jesus will be his redeemed people that he has made overcomers. He says they will be a special treasure unto him. It speaks about the Lord presenting us faultless before the throne of the Father's glory with exceeding joy. It seems too wonderful to believe that we will ever be faultless before the throne of God, but some will be there in whom he has accomplished this work. It is enough to make us bear anything or do anything that he may be glorified in us. Then there are metals. You will find they always have to be melted in the fire. There are two things that have to be removed, first, the earth and soil collected on the outside, which can be taken away with water, but there is usually alloy or baser metals, mingled with the precious ore. You cannot separate these unless you put them in the furnace, and so it has to go into the fire to be melted until the baser metal is gone. It speaks about the refining of gold, if you have been in a furnace it is because God sees some gold in you from which he would remove the alloy. There are some the hardness of whose natures cannot be melted but by continual suffering. That awfully proud, unbreakable spirit, is more like Satan's than the spirit of Christ, and the Lord will let the fire burn hotter and hotter, until your spirit gets broken before him. Some people God cannot do much with except through suffering. By sorrow of heart the spirit is broken, we find in Proverbs 15:13. They are not to blame, they were born that way, but sometimes it is the only thing God can do with them, but when he gets through he is gold. Job said, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. When Job got melted down until he beheld himself and said, I am altogether vile, then God brought him out pure gold and gave him double that he had before. 
Let me give you one other thing. You can carve an image out of wood, but first of all the wood must be cut down. The tabernacle was made of boards covered with gold. The temple was made of beautiful hewn stone but inside were those boards again, the stone did not displace the boards. Those boards once were out in the forest wild, where we all stood in nature. First of all they must be cut down from their original standing, then the bark had to be taken off, that is, like the burnt offering which was flayed. Then it has to be sawn into lengths and planes smooth. A cabinet maker told me once that just as long as any life remained in the wood it would pull apart and move, no matter how you glued it together, there would be conditions that would pull that thing apart, so they kiln dry it, just put it in so hot a place it burns out the natural life. In the tabernacle the boards were covered with gold and fitted into each other perfectly, that is a picture of the temple of the Lord, a picture of God working in the individual and also in the collective temple which he is building, for we are the building or temple of the Holy Ghost. If you went in the temple you would not see a thing but gold, a picture of divinity, and yet there was humanity in it, the wood covered with gold represented humanity lost sight of in divinity, the new man lost sight of in Christ, his image so reproduced in them their image was lost. In that temple everything was ablaze with God, everything in his temple said glory. Humanity ablaze with God, and when he presents you faultless you will be ablaze with the divinity that you have let come into you by being willing to be cut down and put out of sight. Do you wonder the Lord is hard with us sometimes? But it is such a marvelous destiny he has for us, at last the old life gone out of us, and we down in a heap, and the new creation comes up ablaze with the Lord Jesus. The new man is made in the image of God, and all the conflict which we feel, is God getting rid of the old creation, the old thinking, and the old life. Do not resist him, God will never force one. He has the most marvelous redemption possible, but he will never take away any life you want to keep, you must choose what you want and whether you will endure the process, then he alone can take you through to victory.